I hear the voice of my great granddaughter. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter. Singing shut down Wall Street now. Singing shut down Wall Street now. Here with uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges. Chris, thanks so much for taking a moment to talk to me. Not at all. Awesome, great. Well, I'd love to talk to you about what's going on here today. What brings you out? Well, uh, the fact that, as I think most people here recognize, we've undergone a corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, and it's over. They've won. There is no way now within this corporate state, which controls the courts, controls the uh, elected officials, uh, controls the press, uh, uh, certainly controls all systems of finance, uh, all... Uh, forms of government. I mean, it's corporate lobbyists who write our legislation. It's corporate money, which has replaced the vote, which elects our officials, and, and they do corporate bidding. So for those of us who care about resting back our democracy, as well as confronting climate change, mass acts of civil disobedience is all we have left. Any chance you'll be arrested today? I, I teach tonight, and I teach in a prison, and so I'm, that one day a week is kind of sacred for my students. Um, uh, and if it wasn't tonight, I would be. I have been arrested in the past. I will certainly be arrested in the future. Uh, but on Monday night, I have to be in that prison. We are unstoppable. Another world is possible. We are there are a number of themes here. I mean, climate change is a persistent theme. But there's also a very sort of thick anti-capitalist sentiment here. Are the two things linked in an intrinsic way? Well, of course. It's corporate capitalism that has commodified human beings. Uh, and commodified the ecosystem that they then exploit until exhaustion or collapse. There are no internal limits within capitalism, you know, as Karl Marx understood. And the fact is, if we don't begin to set limits, capitalism has built within it, as many economists have noted, a kind of self annihilistic force because since it doesn't have limits, it will just push and push and push until there's nothing more to exploit. Well, do you see a difference between cronyism and capitalism? I mean, are there any useful, valuable things that capitalism does? All of the great political theorists, starting with Aristotle, you know, going up through Max Weber or anywhere else, have understood that the qualities that go into make someone a good capitalist do not make them a good citizen. Aristotle talked about capitalism? Yes, he, Aristotle talked about an oligarchy, and an oligarchy as being the enemy of democracy, and we certainly live within an oligarchic system. That's, so when I think capitalism, I think Adam Smith, who called it the natural system of liberty, this notion that people own themselves, that they own property, that they're able to exchange it freely with one another for various uh -huh. things. At its core, like that is capitalism, this notion of a free market. Like, how exactly does that sort of turn everything into a commodity? Is it the notion that there's any ownership at all no, because that's objectionable? Because there's no free market. That's a myth. You okay. know, I mean, let's talk about African Americans in America. Who, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the history of African Americans who built this country with their hands and their blood, their sweat. And what happened? What happened after emancipation? White supremacy stepped in and created a system of economic control. They refused to give them any land. Through share copying, they right. threw them into debt peonage. So that the idea that they're free, that, that capitalism is somehow free, when you are the right. Koch brothers, don't talk to me of freedom. Well, well, now, most of what you just described, though, those are actually actions of the state. This isn't the market that is turning black people into subjects that's but refusing who, who, to allow them to own property. Actually, the solution was to empower them and allow them to own no. property and to be equal and free citizens. Isn't they, that the solution? Well, th that is not what happened after emancipation. No, I'm not saying that's what happened, but that's what ought so do, to have happened. Think they're isn't the goal? They're working on behalf of the white slave owners. Who is that? The government, um, I I including, you know, once Andrew Jackson pulled everybody out for reconstruction, then you began the reign of terror and the rollback. The, the, the government, just as government works today on behalf of multinational, so, let me finish, uh -huh. multinational corporations, right after slavery, you saw government acting on behalf of white southern slave owners, and I'm talking about a northern government. And then, and then a government actually comes in and removes government's foot from the heat from the neck of the black person after the civil rights movement. Isn't no, that problem, pretty much what happened? No, the problem was that once Jackson removed the occupation troops in the South, life became a living hell for black right. people. And the only force they had that was kind of any firewall between them and their former slaveholders 
was the government. Right, and it, there's a danger of sort of meandering down a path about well, sort of uh, slavery. I, I wonder though, well, I mean, you're, talking, describing, you're describing the state's actions towards blacks. It seems to me that the state's actions and the actions of, of the markets, sort of the markets operation, free exchange, two totally different things. Like conflating the two isn't really useful in understanding the notion that we have property rights, that we have innovation that takes place, and that yeah, people okay, can exchange let's, let's goods name, with one let's another. Let's name innovation. Innovation means you throw all of your manufacturing overseas and you pay workers 22 cents an hour to work in sweatshops in Bangladesh. And the American. I mean, we had, we had sweatshops here as well, I'll right? do the interview, but you can't interrupt me. And, and the fact is, what happens to superfluous labor in America? They're incarcerated. What, happen what happens to superfluous labor? They're incarcerated. Okay, I understand. Well, that, well I, that I, is what happens. I think at the end of the day, though, at the end of the day, though, when we actually talk about sweatshops, we had sweatshops here. People, well, and then people, we had labor unions. Make, labor unions created the middle class in this country. That's certainly part of that's part of what happened. I no, mean, no, wage well. rates wage rates increase. We're actually seeing wage rates increase in Bangladesh, all over China. That is happening at this stage, is it not? N not by much. Wage rates, but wage rates no, are I mean, increasing. Wage somehow, rates are increasing. These people people live, have been brought out of poverty. They are leaving subsistence no. farms all I over China, I suggest, moving to the cities, I suggest moving you, to the cities to pursue jobs. Go, that's not happening. No, it's not. You go to so there is no wealth creation taking place in China. Millions aren't being lifted out of. A neo feudal elite, just like here. Nope. So, so lots of people haven't been lifted out of poverty. Yeah, Only but, a neo feudal yeah, see, elite. You can't judge wealth by wages. So when you come and work for a factory in southern China, fair. and you can't, your wages don't give you enough to eat. And when you don't make your quotas, you got to climb to the top of your dormitory and jump off and commit suicide, which happens regularly because people are not paid. When you have no protection from the exploitive class, and when the exploitive class is in bed with the government, then you, you, you have to talk about a form of neo-feudalism. I think there's, there's a lot of strong language there. I do wonder, though, is it inappropriate to take a look at what conditions were like before? Like, what would lead someone to leave a subsistence farm and then to go take a fairly low-paying well, job in a you, factory? I, I can, you I know you exactly don't want to be cut off, I, no, but I it's okay to cut me off. No, That's fine. I grew up in a farm town, uh -huh. and you know what destroyed every small dairy farm? Were agribusinesses. And I watched these family farms go down that have been in the farm, and I watched sure. these farmers kill themselves. And, and, and what destroyed uh, subsistence agriculture in India? It was commodity cash crops. Oh, isn't the supermarket a wonderful thing? You live under an apple tree, and the apple tree produces so many apples, you don't know what to do. So, you go to the supermarket, and you give the supermarket your money, and the, and the supermarket gives you apples in return and you say oh isn't the supermarket a wonderful thing i mean the idea that that uh that people are actually free in a system of global capitalism is is it, it's just not borne out by economic well, reality I, I won't dominate the, the rest of your day or anything i would right. like to pursue this a little further if that's okay the the notion commodity cash crops you scale up at one point in this country, most people were in agriculture. At this stage, very few people are actually in agriculture, yet we're able to produce a tremendous amount of food. We do it at a really, really low cost. We do it at such a low cost all over the world that we're able to feed many more times than, than what other folks might have thought. We actually thought there was a population crisis at one point in this country. We found a way to feed, a global population crisis in fact, we found a way to feed those people, and it's because of these agro-businesses, absolutely, some people are harmed when they can no longer compete with a new method of doing business. But on net, it seems to me that it is better to be able to feed people in a cheaper and more affordable way than to hold on to an old, an old model of producing food that is incredibly labor intensive and really, really expensive. It's not cheaper and more affordable. It's as, not cheaper. No, if you go into any marginal area including in parts of this city, they are food deserts because they can't afford to buy tomatoes that are trucked all the way across the country from California. Can we, I mean, globally though, globally speaking and broadly in the United States of America, there are certainly any number of factors that have to do with the way that New York City is, is operated and the fact that I can kind of only buy food at a bodega or a Whole Foods. That's, I think, a separate and a part from whether or not people on average have a higher standard of living than they did say 40 or 50 years ago. The Green Revolution is something that happened, that improved the quality of people's lives. I, 
I'm willing to accept that there are any number of shortcomings in the world that we live in, but it seems like we have to acknowledge the fact that free markets have been pivotal, pivotal in lifting people out of poverty and providing innovations and creating a better and more prosperous world. And we can even afford to live in a cleaner world. Is that, I mean, that seems like a fair statement. You think America's a more prosperous country than we were a the, few decades ago? Absolutely. Well, I don't know, Do I think you come from another planet then. Really? Half of this country. Now I see. Lives, I see. I see a democratized don't, don't media me. that's incredibly me. affordable. Don't interrupt here. me. I said half of this country now lives in either poverty or near poverty. The working class has been decimated in this country. You go into urban centers like Camden, New Jersey, uh, and people are living where I suggest you go visit. You know the idea that you're talking about free markets when up the street we have Goldman Sachs, commodity traders that buy up world futures of rice, yes. wheat, corn, livestock, so that jack up commodity prices by 200 percent. So people and I've worked in Africa and see I covered the famine in the Sudan. People literally starve. I mean this 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 vision that you have, this economic vision, is not connected to well, reality. And I'll be finished. It's a non-reality based belief system that is peddled by an oligarchic elite. Decolonize the water, decolonize the land. We're changing up the system, we're changing up the land. Because even this country, I mean, you don't have to go far. You can go across the river into parts of New Jersey. Go to sure. Newark. I mean, you know, walk around the streets of New York, Newark. Look at the infrastructure. Look at how people are struggling. Don't tell me we're better off. It just doesn't make any well, there's, sense. Well, there's no doubt that there are still poor people. There is still poverty. That is not going any place. At some, you're always going to have that. I think the question becomes whether or not, whether or not you're actually. Uh, whether or not you're actually moving in the direction of a better and more prosperous society as a we're consequence not. We're not. of actually having free exchange and free trade. We're not. And I, and I don't know that that's wrong. We're not. That. We're not moving in a better you, direction. Why should we hey, we'll end it there because i got to do another one. Okay. We're not moving in a better direction. Okay.